KBTC, a viewer-supported community service of Bates Technical College. From KBTC Public Television Studios in Tacoma, Washington. Welcome to the Steve on the Street podcast, a closer look behind the headlines as public policy and current affairs impact the real lives of real people. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. This is Steve Kickens, photojournalist and reporter on KBTC Public Television. This podcast is produced by Northwest Now. Today, we're talking about the child care cost crisis across our state, across the country, really. And we speak with a number of folks about this issue, including a single mom uh, who lives down in South Seattle. She's got a couple of young kids, and she thanks her lucky stars that her two kids are in a, a program that's subsidized by taxpayers in the city of Seattle. And then we'll have a longer discussion with a woman who helps run the nonprofit company called Launch, which hosts nearly nine facilities across Seattle and a couple more outside of the city's limits to help keep kids busy in a structured environment where they're not always looking and feeling like they're trapped into a classroom. That's the topic for today's podcast. Truly is a village and uh, everybody doesn't have that and I'm, I'm learning that. Single mom Julia Nelson counts her blessings a Seattle Public Schools partnership with child care nonprofit Launch folds her two kids into before and after school programs that allow her to work full time as a nurse. As a mother, to make sure your kids, when you drop your kids off to a place <clears throat> that you don't have to worry about if they're okay, if they're safe, that's a whole different feeling. Launch has been around for decades, operating programs from multiple locations in and around Seattle creating supervised, safe spaces for kids pre-K up to 12 years old. The nonprofit says there are multiple reasons child care costs have continued rising over the years, but even bigger lately are challenges securing donations and grants. They've seen a push similar programs out of business. I'm getting notifications on a weekly basis of this center is closing, this center is closing, you know, that child care providers are just, we are, we are not able to you know, continue to run as businesses. According to Launch's most recent report from the 21-22 school year, the nonprofit served 573 youth. 44% of those kids come from families earning low to moderate income. 56% of their kids are students of color. In that same year, Launch helped pay nearly a quarter million dollars in tuition assistance for needy families. And that's up 50% from the previous year. Launch knows for every kid enrolled in its programs, Many more get left behind without structured supervision. You know, they're very isolated. Um, they're not kind of getting opportunities to be with peers in a non-school setting. So middle class kind of gets the, the, the nastier end of the stick the most, you know, because we want to work, we want to do things, we want to, you know, go to work. We are some single parent homes, even two parent homes. You know, the finances aren't meeting what we need. But we want to work. We don't want to sit on steady assistance. Nelson believes Launch exposes her kids and peers to lessons taught beyond the classroom. But meeting the growing need and expense is a challenge that will keep more kids from benefits of trained staff, says Launch. There needs to be some level of intervention from a governmental, local, Washington State, national. If kids don't have spaces to go after school, if there's no high quality preschool programs, if you can't put your infant into a into a space so you can go back to work, then it's going to lead to massive impact to our workforce. In Seattle, Steve Kiggins, Northwest Now. Laura Nicholson uh, with Launch, thanks for joining me. On Thank you for podcast, having me. Certainly <laughs> to talk about child care affordability. If we're talking this organization is some 50 years old, so is the problem. Oh, yeah. Why it's, does this persist? You know, I think that you could probably write a dissertation about why the problem persists. And I think 
um, you know, the, the big issues have and kind of continue to be um, that child care is considered, you know, low wages, low expertise, and, you know, low need. And we're talking about um, some pretty massive cultural changes that have happened in this country over the past, you know, 100 years. And many, many, many of our systems, including our education system, were built around the idea that there is a parent, typically a mother, who is home and available to take care of her children. Um, and that is not the case. That is not the truth anymore. And it has not been the case for a very long time. And so, uh, you know, after school programs, child care programs, infant programs, you know, you have to find a space for your kid to go. Because what also is true is that most families can't afford to have one parent stay home. Um, you know, my, uh, my husband and I joke all the time about, you know, how is it possible that we make this much money and it's such a strain to have two children in child care, but we also can't afford for one of us to stay home. And that is, I think, the fundamental problem um, is that it's just, it's kind of a catch-22. And um, specifically with uh, younger children, kind of that birth to three uh, age range, infant care is some of the absolute most expensive care that you can find. It is the equivalent to paying tuition for a private uh, you know, highly regarded high school or even a, a private college. In the Seattle area, the average cost of a um, of an infant program, you know, starting at six weeks could be anywhere between $2,800 to $3,500 a, a month just for somebody to take care of, of your infant. Um, That's and a relatively it, small mortgage. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> And, and that's a choice that a lot of families are having to make. And so, you know, even in an in-home um, facility, my own, I have a, I have an 11 month old and she's in an in-home and it is close to the amount of our mortgage that we pay for her to be, to be in an infant, um, infant program that we love dearly and it's fantastic. Uh, but it, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big consideration for, for us as a family as, Again, we also see inflation going up and all these other costs continuing to go up, that it, it's becoming more and more untenable. And I yeah. think then you also see that reflected in childcare, like launch. You know, we have, we have staff, we have programs, we have kids, and, you know, over three quarters of our budget is people. We, we have to pay for people because a, a person means a group of kids. And so... Um, you know, there's no ways to kind of do cost reductions or anything around something like that. You need to have somebody there. And, you know, we want to make sure that they're high quality, that they're well trained, that we're paying them a living wage because they live in Seattle or they live in proximity to Seattle. And so what is true both here locally in Seattle and across the United States is that the tuition that programs like Launch uh, charge families does not cover the true cost of having the child in the program. And so agencies like Launch and others are basically covering the difference out of kind of our other other spaces through um, fundraising, through grants, through um, major gifts and trying to find donors and, and just really looking for other spaces. And in this kind of post-pandemic world, you were also seeing a cliff of charitable giving. And so uh, agencies like Launch are, you know, trying to be nimble and look for other ways. Um, but we also, you know, uh, eight of our nine schools are Title I schools, which means that they hit a threshold of serving low-income students, typically minority students. And so we also have to live and will continue to live our mission, which is serving students furthest from educational justice, which means we cannot pass the cost of, of the care on to families. And so we have to look for other ways to, to do it. Um, you probably couldn't pass that we cost. No, we, we, uh, we continue to, like I said, keep looking for other ways to kind of offset those costs. Um, you know, we've been really lucky over, I don't want to say lucky, we've been, um, very aggressive in our fundraising and have gotten lots of grants and support over the years. But, 
it's a different landscape than it was. Um, you know, as as everybody is dealing with inflation, so are you know uh, major gifts, major donors. I, you know, I'll give an example. There's um, you know these these grants that come out, and uh, there's some grants that come out through the Department of Children, Youth, and Families um, in Washington State, and it's you know it's typically for some very specific types of programs, so like supporting students with special needs or you know equity focused instruction, and um, I'd have to get you the exact numbers, but about this time last year, there was a there was four million dollars available for this specific type of grant, and they received over eighty million dollars in applications for that four million dollars. And if that does not tell you what that what the need is, I mean, there it is, just right there in black and white. Is that for the sure. agencies just can't can't afford to continue to run these deficit budgets to to kind of keep up with everything when our our main cost is people. Um, so so what and, happens to let me interject. What happens yeah. to this population of of youth that we probably don't hear this term a lot anymore but probably still very much exist these latchkey kids, right? These kids that parents would really love to have this kind of help but don't and are now forced to just kind of wander to home all alone for hours, that population is probably pretty large in growth as well. Yeah, I would say that there is, you know, and that's a hard, it would be kind of a hard number to, to capture because I would also speculate that most families would not be really willing to, to right. put that out there, that that was a choice that they were having to make. But for a lot of families, that's going to be a choice that they're going to have to make. You know, in the Seattle region and across Washington, I'm getting notifications on a weekly basis of this center is closing, this center is closing, you know, that child care providers are just, we are, we are not able to, you know, continue to run as businesses because ultimately that's what we all are, um, our businesses. There is no federal subsidization of programs like this. There is subsidies that families can receive to subsidize their pay, but the, the, the differential is not enough to to cover kind of the true cost of the care. So um, what is so what is the impact to those families and those kids? You might be able to study, or or or, or, or those uh, big brain folks at universities might be able to study right the impact of of that early and late day education extension and the stress it relieves on on families. How does that compare, do we know, with young people growing up without that kind of assistance? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we can even think back on, you know, that that was a much more common phenomenon probably 20, 30 years ago because there wasn't a lot of robust after school programs. And, you know, I do think that you um, could definitely make kind of some speculation around, you know, success rates or, you know, where we really see it show up a lot is around like social emotional um, spaces for, for kids is that, you know, they're very isolated. Um, they're not kind of getting opportunities to be with peers in a non-school setting. They're not necessarily getting the academic help that they might need. Um, and so, and it also could be, you know, it, including with some families, you know, we see a lot of um, attendance issues when families are having to make a choice between, you know, going to their job or getting their kid to school. And that is a horrific choice for a family to have to make. Um, we need we need our job to put food on the table. We need our kid to go to school. And sometimes we can't get both happening. Um, and so what we do see also is that there has been a push, you know, for after school programs to really be um, and Launch has been doing this pretty significantly of centering kids that, you know, might come to us through the principal or through somebody else in the school who, you know, they're looking for ways to support a family. And the, the, key, the key component would be an, a high quality after school program, a safe space for them to be until 6 p.m. Um, instead of, you know, going home or choosing not to come to school in the morning because there's nobody there to, to make that happen for them. There's also interesting because also in the public sector that exists already, there's already like some components to this that seem to fit in, but are siloed. So we're talking like free breakfast programs, free lunch programs, free meal programs, right? Like after school, 
uh, sports, like all of this kind of exists in the same realm, mm -hmm. but for some reason it's all kind of not necessarily connected in a way that's cohesive or in a way that might be able to reach as many students as possible. No doubt people in your industry would love to have, you know, classrooms full of kids hanging out yeah. together out of classroom, uh, not, yeah. you know, not, not within that, that deep learning environment, but just to learn how to interact with each other and their peers so they can use those lessons to develop their, their adult lives. Yeah, and I think, you know, <clears throat> most agencies, like I'll use Atlanta Launch as an example, you know, because the st there's a staffing crisis, because we also need to find people that are willing to work, you know, $21 an hour, part-time schedule, that also want to work with children and are good at working with children. And so, you know, we... Their, Washington State has some very strong laws around like ratios that you can run programs with. And so, um, you know, part of it, I was touching earlier about how uh, expensive infant care is, and it's because actually part of it, part of it is because of the state mandated ratio of how many staff you need to have per child. Um, and so in, for launch, you know, with our preschool family or preschool students, it's a 10 to 1 ratio. I cannot serve an 11th student without a second staff person in that classroom. And then the same goes for an after school program. It's for uh, every one adult is 15 kids. I cannot serve a 16th student without hiring a second staff person. And so it's always this push and pull of, I only have this many staff and I can, so I can serve this many kids. Launch has been carrying a wait list of two, between 200 and 300 students for our programs really since the onset of the pandemic. Um, and it's, it's because it is so difficult to find staff. And, um, you know, we, we are a business. And so we also need to, to look at the, the cost of, you know, I can't add that 16 student because I'd have to hire another teacher. So I, I need to make sure I can add another 15 students. And then we run into space issues because we are located, co-located in, you know, public spaces, you know, I'd love to serve 100, 150 kids, but that also is, you know, uh, predicated on whether or not I can get enough space to run a 150 kid program because the other component of the um, Department of Children, Youth and Family kind of mandates is a certain amount of square footage per child. Um, and so yeah. that has also been a, a huge burden on, on licensed child care in this state has been uh, the amount of oversight uh, of the Washington Administrative Code that, that governs these things, the, um, the lift of even just kind of managing and monitoring those requirements typically falls to, you know, a site manager or even a lead teacher. And, and it's a lot when you're also working with kids day in and day out. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not, you know, the office of the superintendent of public instruction, you know, we're talking about the same kids. We're talking about that same group of 15 kindergartners have been in a classroom all day with one teacher with 30 kids, which I'm not saying that that necessarily means that it's a high quality thing that's happening. And I know that, that it's not, um, and that we want to see lower ratios, but, you know, it, it has always been a, a struggle of, um, you know, why why is licensed child care so highly regulated to the point where it's so burdensome when we're talking about you know the same group of kids that are there that are in a in a classroom all day. Well, the good news is that places like Lodge and taxpayers all come to an agreement to identify what's valuable and sustain it. So that's good. I don't want to focus entirely on what sounds like a real downer because it <laughs> seems like a, a really steep climb. So let's talk about um, really the impact for these families. I mean, the, the, the mother that I met earlier this week, she would climb the tallest mountain around. So Mount Rainier with a big flag that says launch on it. She'd carry it to the top and sing your praises. She's yeah. a nurse. You know, she's got two kids in the program already. She's about to uh, I think she says she's planning to add a third and she couldn't do her life without it. And no doubt there's 
varying degrees of you know, uh, of severity and necessity, but all of that is on the spectrum, no doubt. And then the real impact of these kids, these young people who get to learn how to interact with their peers, where they might otherwise be stuck in a bedroom for four hours. I mean, the 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 work you guys are doing is really important for in terms of developing our society at large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, especially our after-school programs, we have um, been very cognizant of and specific about the types of types of programs, types of expectations of teachers and what is happening in those classrooms. And so we have a very strong um, racial equity focus, and that is showing up in the interactions and the instruction that is happening every day in those after-school programs. Um, we partner with uh, you know, local tribes, local other nonprofits to, you know, bring bring people in to really give students in the after school programs this global perspective, but tying it to their local community. And and this is what it means to, to live in Seattle, to live in these spaces that are so diverse. And um, this is how you as a citizen can show up in those spaces and um, with empathy and and understanding of other cultures, um, and then you know the other big component of it is that we try to we try to make it. What are some things that you would never get a chance to do during the school day? So one of our our strongest partners is uh, another. Um, nonprofit uh, called Double Dutch Divas, and they come in and they do Double Dutch with the kids. And I cannot tell you how joyful that is for kids to see. And it's so, you know, it sounds so simple. They're just coming in and doing jump rope, but it is so powerful for our students. They're getting the physical, they're, they're, it's an emotionally safe space. Everybody's on the same playing field because, I mean, I don't know how to double dutch and every time I've gone I'm like I'm not doing that but they're so encouraging of not just are the staff so encouraging of students to try it also and of each other to try it but the kids are so encouraging of each other you know this that's scary let me help you let me show you how to do that um, and it has just been so transformational to see to see that joy um, especially for this this generation of kids who spent the majority of the last well two, two and a half years kind of remote and in these really scary spaces of, you know, seeing the news and seeing the masks and being told they have to stay home and that it's dangerous to be outside, to be in groups of people. And so how do you bring that joy back for students um, in, in an after school program setting like that? So Right. I try and consider, I just, uh, I just filed a report dealing with the healthy youth survey. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the name of it, Youth Healthy Survey. I forget what it was, the exact name of it. But it's uh, it's a thing. It's been a while in the state. And we're, they're talking with older kids, but not much. And there's a little bit of overlap there in those ages. And if they've got siblings, that might not be that far off from the, from the, the anxiety mm -hmm. and the depression and the hopelessness that some of the, of the older kids are feeling might rub off or already just kind of be building organically in these younger folks, which is really striking to even just like consider. Yeah. I mean, what a world we have. So where, I guess in your magic eight ball, where's, where's the medium, the happy medium for making the, the biggest difference possible, reaching as many kids as possible. Um, responsibly and maybe that's maybe there's not a right way to answer it to ask that question i mean the the, the measure of a, of a society is how well we treat our most vulnerable and if they are it why aren't they being treated like the most vulnerable yeah so i think I mean, gosh, <laughs> what a comp i could i could go on for hours about the answer to that question it's, I funny, think it's that totally political what we're willing to pay for and and that's I mean that's really what it comes down to is that it is for for many agencies like Launch this is our mission this is our vision this is what we're here to do we're here to serve kids we're here to to um, lead the charge to brilliant outcomes for students in our care and it's also an unfunded mandate because 
you know, what what is not going to work is for agencies like Launch and all the rest of them to say, we're not doing this anymore, or we're going to start co- charging the true cost. Your monthly tuition is going to be $1,500 for an after-school program and, you know, $2,000 because that's, that's how much it really costs for us to be able to do this. And that's not a step or um, a route that is acceptable. It shouldn't be acceptable. It shouldn't be acceptable to me as somebody who works here. It shouldn't be acceptable to families. And it really shouldn't be acceptable to our society that that, that is the, the space that we're in. And I think, you know, the, the, age, the child care landscape has been in crisis. COVID happened and you know, we, we all kind of limped through it. Uh, again, kind of unfunded mandate. Launch provided all day programs to support kids who were learning virtually. So we brought kids into classrooms, set them up on their computers, and supported them learning virtually so their parents could go to work. And that was an unfunded mandate. There was no there was no additional you know, money that came to support something like that. It was because people who do this work are so passionate about it. Um, but there's only so much that it can bear before before it starts going away. And so you you will start seeing these, you know, more local uh, agencies closing. And, um, you know, even some of the, the larger scale ones, like the global or the, you know, national ones, at a certain point, it's not going to make sense for them to keep keep the doors open because it's not. Um, if, if any other business was being told that you had to run a deficit budget indefinitely, they would say, "We're closing. <laughs> We're not going to do that because that's not fiscally responsible to do." Yeah. Um, and that is how many, many agencies have been having to run for many, many years. But still you do it. And still Launch does it decades later. Yeah. Which speaks to the passion. Parents and professionals step into that gap. Mm-hmm. And says maybe yeah. maybe it'll be a challenge elsewhere, but not here. And not for my kids. And we've, uh, you know, in full transparency, Launch has had to make some really difficult decisions over the past, you know, year, uh, last six months, last three months. But what we haven't done anything to is we have not touched anything that would impact the success of children in our programs, the quality, the that we're not turning kids away. And, uh, you know, if we have a wait list, we're doing everything we can to bring staff into the door. But when it comes to what is happening on the ground with the kids, that is going to continue to remain the same. And they're going to keep having joy in, in our programs. So strategically, like, uh, just, just to kind of put, maybe put a bow on this, is, is the message or the effort then moved towards our legislature? and uh, our lawmakers to determine or to convince this is a sound investment that frankly is still underfunded so many years later. Is that is that the kind of trajectory? Yeah, and I think that's, um, you know, you, agencies shouldn't have to be out, for lack of a better word, begging for donors and, you know, people that are so disconnected from the, the types of programs to, to fund it. Um, and like I said, Launch has been strategic over the years and has, you know, developed those relationships and continue to do so. But even, you know, some of our long-term funders have said, you know, we went from maybe getting 10 to 15 requests a year to 250. And we, it's just, it's overwhelming. It's an overwhelming um, space to be in. And so, yes, I think, you know, the overall message is that there needs to be some level of intervention from a governmental, local, Washington state, national, um, because this is not just a parent problem. If 
if kids don't have spaces to go after school, if there's no high quality preschool programs, if you can't put your infant into a into a space so you can go back to work, then it's going to lead to massive impact to our workforce. Because ultimately people, if they can't try to save space for their kid to go, they're just gonna stop going to work. Um, and then there's just the ripple effect of that. As people stop going to work, then there's a hit to unemployment and to other social services. And so, you know, investing in kids shouldn't doesn't feel like it should be quite so hard to do. Um, and and yet it continues to be such a political um, space that you know it sometimes it feels um, years away. But I continue to be hopeful and I continue to advocate for and put our voice out here. And, um, you know, uh, one of the really positive things that came out of the pandemic is that a lot of providers like Launch um, in this area came together and we, we formed a coalition. So we're using our collective voice to advocate for and make our voices heard. And that the strength of that is um, kind of unprecedented in this area. So it sounds just a little bit like if do you want to pay for it now or do you want to pay for it later? Yeah. Because we all pay for it no matter what. Yes. And how do you want to pay for it? Do you want to pay for it now to bring joy or do you want to pay for it later when we're having to pay, you know, Real higher? Costs. I mean, it's, Real it's tangible just, costs. Yeah. Wow. Well, you're so kind to share some thoughts, Laura Nicholson, with Launch. Um, uh, the, it takes people that are clearly passionate about what they do to stick through thick and thin. So thank goodness there's folks like you. And thank goodness there's families like the single mother we met earlier this week who recognize that kind of dedication and, frankly, sacrifice. Because, I mean, you could be doing something else. <laughs> but what else would you do? <laughs> something i have thought about in the middle of the night especially in that first couple months of the pandemic it was like what is happening right now yeah. but you know here here i am you know uh, i started with launch about three weeks before the pandemic oh my goodness <laughs> so um and, and here i am three and a half years later Yeah, Laura is not going anywhere. She's obviously followed her passion to work with youth, and her passion includes their betterment, and frankly, the betterment for the rest of our society. And thanks to Joya Nelson for being brave enough to speak with me on Northwest Now and sharing her story with her two kids. And thank you for joining me on the podcast. I'm Steve Kickens. We'll see you next time. Whoa.